All right, everybody. So welcome to Creating a Florida Friendly Landscape. My name is Tia Salvesi, and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Orange County. And I also have our partner with us from Orange County Utilities, Terry Thill. Hi, Terry. Hello. All <laughs> right. Well, let's get started with a couple messages from our partners. All right, yes, thank you so much. And um, I work with the con water conservation section in the water division of Orange County Utilities. And really, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to share with you, with you all what um, we do to help um, our customers save water. Now, these programs would just be for our customers and Orange County Utilities. That would be in unincorporated portions of the county. So if you live in the city of Orlando or Apopka or Winter Park, you wouldn't be eligible for these programs, but a lot of these um, cities, they have their own programs. Yeah. Um, next slide. Oh, and just, oh, now this first screen, all about our programs, occonserwewater.net. We have a, um, you all know that we have watering restrictions right now. Um, we've had these, gosh, probably what, 20 years, longer than 20 years, I believe, for a long yeah, time. Yeah, long time. Yeah, and right now, of course, it's only one day a week watering because, of course, the grass goes semi-dormant. You know, of course, it's not as hot as summer. So grass should survive and thrive with just one week of water, one day per week of watering. And at this time, you know, if you have reclaimed water, you do not um, have restrictions. You can water every day if you want, but why would you want to do that? Simply because we don't want dollar weed, you know, that is still a valuable resource, reclaim water. And actually Orange County Utilities is going through the process of amending our um, water conservation restriction ordinance so that reclaim water would also be restricted. So that's that's being discussed right now. Because again, it is a very valuable um, resource. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And WaterWise Neighbor Program is our big program which there's many, many things that encompass um, underneath the WaterWise Neighbor Program. We've had our, um, if you have a really, really old toilet, that's gosh, I think it was 1992, where it went into law that you have to have low flow toilets. So if you have a newer home, you, you probably have low flow toilets, but if you have an older home and you haven't changed out your toilets in a while, we can, um, if you go to your local um, dealer, and purchase a toilet, we can give you a rebate up to $100. We'll actually credit your water bill for a toilet or two or three. Um, and a lot of people have spent, what, 30 years, so you may have an old toilet. Um, that's one really popular program. Another popular program is um, we'll give you free shower heads, the either just the fixed or the handheld shower heads. And all you have to do is attend a um, Waterways Neighbor Program webinar meeting. And it's just a one hour meeting. They're held, they're held most, um, most months. Mm -hmm. And it's just about an hour. You, we also get free um, aerators, which help to um, conserve water in your kitchen sink and your bathroom sinks. And one important thing, thing that people love is we can also give, give you a, um, a smart irrigation controller. So a timer, if you would like a new timer for your irrigation system, um, we can also provide you with one of those after you've completed this one, one hour class. And a lot of people like to kind of be at work or be somewhere and say, oh, did my, is my sprinkler going on right now? I turned it to go on right now. Let me check. You know, a lot of people like to do that from their smartphones. And also, um, we also give out um, MP rotator sprinkler heads. They're much more efficient sprinkler heads than, um, unfortunately, that are kind of out there. Um, we give away, I think, at least 20, up to 20 per you know, house, depending on the size of your, of your property. So those are some real advantages to um, signing up on our portal for our next upcoming class. Yeah, and I have the wrong dates up here, whoops, but you can go to the website, um, www.occonservewater.net, or you can email them at thewater.wise at ocfl. Dot net. And you guys just have so many great, you know, incentive programs, Terry. It's good to take advantage of all of them. Yeah, we, oh, and I forgot the rain barrels. We give away, we have like two or three sessions 
where we you just have to come to a class and you can get a um, rain barrel at no charge. People love that. Oh yeah, those are really nice rain barrels too that you guys have. Yeah, they're I think a value of like eighty or a hundred dollars. It's it's yeah, and you just cheap, have to be an Orange sure. County Utilities customer to get that. Yes, yes. Okay, great. One last one for you. Oh, you know what? We should have taken that one off. <laughs> okay. We um we actually have another program. It's similar to this, but it's called our Timer Consultation Program, and um. We have found that a lot of times people really don't know how to use their controller, which is fine. We can bring out one of our water watch, um, our supervisor or technician, and he can teach you how to set your timer to the correct, to the correct um, times. And um, this is a very popular program. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they kind of set it and forget it. And they're like, oh, you know, my landscaper set it. And the next thing you know, they're getting a watering violation and multiple violations. Unfortunately, Orange County Utilities um, if you have more than one, we'll charge you, you know, it's a $25 fine each time after the first kind of a warning. So we have a timer consultation program, which um, might be beneficial to you, or maybe one of your neighbors would like that. And you can, we, we suggest that if you have a rotor type of sprinkler head, that the um, sprinkler head just runs for 30 minutes. And if you have a spray, that it runs for 15 minutes. But by law, you can run up to an hour. But to me, that seems like an awfully long time. <laughs> And um, for this program, do you do the same contact here, the same water dot wise, if you want the timer inspection? Yeah, they, they can contact that number or that website, sure, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a lot of times, with, like right now, the, our water watch team is very busy because people have set their, their um, controllers back to the one day a week and people are like, oh no, it was two, but now you have to have it at one. So they may have forgotten how to use it. And so we're out there setting timers. <laughs> Yeah, that's how it works. Well, that's a great program and a lot of great programs through Orange County Utilities. So thanks so much, Terry, for being here with us today. Um, I was going to say, I can, I can hang around if people think of questions or whatever. I can hang around if people think of questions or... Great. So thank you so thank much. You. All right. Well, on to the Florida friendly portion. So um, my name is Tia Solvesi and I'll be teaching the webinar today. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent in Orange County. And I've been into, you know, horticulture and stuff my whole life. And um, I grew up on a farm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've had various jobs at plant nurseries, um, studied environmental science at the University of Central Florida. And then I got my master's degree in tropical plant and soil science from the University of Hawaii. And I've been with the University of Florida in um, research and extension now for about five years. So I just like love the Florida friendly program and, you know, nature, growing food, whatnot. So um, we have a lot of information to cover today about the Florida friendly landscaping program. And our program delivers science based education to homeowners, you know, residents on the residential level also commercial landscapers and professionals in the green industry. And then we also have a side that advises like home builders and developers, you know, before the house even gets built. So that's a great place for us to start. And um, so it's developed by the University of Florida in partnership with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, also the water management districts. And so a lot of people, a lot of brilliant minds went into developing this program and ultimately these best management practices, which are kind of expressed as the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. Today's class will cover all nine of these principles um, kind of in depth. Now we're going to spend a lot of time on number one, two, and three, and then we're kind of going to breeze through the rest of them. So, so don't worry if you know, half an hour goes by and we're still talking about right plant, right place, because that's really the overarching principle. If you plant the right plant in the right place, then, you know, a lot of things will just fall in place. So you want the right plant for the right zone and, you know, you know the part of your yard with the sun and the water, and that will help, you know, the plants can meet their own needs and it will minimize your amount of maintenance. 
So on a large scale, you know, we want to find the right plant for the right place in our climatic zone. And if you're in central Florida, like Orlando area, you're going to be in zone 9B, and this is the USDA hardiness zone based on the annual um, average annual minimum temperature. So kind of like how cold does it get? Like we can't quite go grow um, coconuts and uh, breadfruit up here in Orlando, but a little further south, Miami and the Florida Keys, you know, they can because it doesn't freeze down there. Um, also pay attention to microclimates, you know, the sunny side or the shady side, or maybe you're under a big tree and that will help keep it a little bit warmer. And the, the sun direction. So if your front of the house faces the sun, then it might be a little warmer. You might be able to get away with planting something a little bit more tropical. Um, another thing you want to do is analyze your site conditions. So, you know, more on the ground level, walk around, observe your site, look at your soil type. You probably have sand but it might also be uh, clay or limestone rock or silt. You can do a pH test. Um, we offer that at our extension office in Orange County for a fee of $2. And then is your soil wet or dry? You know, is it hot and sunny or, or kind of more cool and shady and wet? And then the drainage, do you have standing water or does it drain pretty good? Are you in full sun, part sun or shade? You know, what is some existing landscape material you're going to have to work with? You know, if you have a big oak tree, then you're going to have to pick some shade tolerant plants. And then more on the human side, you know, what do you want it to look like? The views, do you want to see your neighbor's yard or do you want to look out and see a butterfly garden? And then what kind of walkways, driveways, you know, maybe pool, fence, tool shed are you going to have? So these, all of these things you kind of jot down on your landscape plan and you start with the big ideas and like, Harry, I want this little area of lawn and then I want a little vegetable garden. And then you kind of start putting them, you know, in, in the place that you want them. Maybe you want the vegetables like right outside of your kitchen, or maybe you want the patio as you exit your kitchen. And so um, you start with the big concepts and then you can kind of boil it down to some specific plants. You might come up with something like, all right, I need a, a nice small size tree and maybe I want it to be a flowering tree or a fruit tree or an evergreen tree or you know something specific for your personal um, desires. So when you're looking at the plant selection, it's a great idea to use our Florida Friendly Landscaping um, guide to plant selection and um, landscape design. And that will tell you all these things about each individual plant. We have about 400 species of plants listed in that book. And um, you can find the digital version also on our website, Florida Friendly, just Google Florida Friendly Landscaping. And our publications are listed there in a digital version. So you want to look at, is it native or invasive? Um, we, Florida Friendly can include native, but Florida Friendly does not include any invasive species. So like a Brazilian pepper tree, that is not Florida Friendly and we won't recommend planting that. Um, also look at the mature height, uh, how tall it gets and the mature spread. Like that picture there on the bottom of the palm tree, you know, it's just way too close to that house. And it's going to have to grow, you know, for like another 10 years to get above the house for its canopy to spread out. So give plenty of distance away from the houses. Um, also, what is the pH range of the plants? If you get the pH test done, then you'll know what the soil is in your yard. If you have kind of low pH or high pH, you might need to specifically find plants, you know, that can tolerate that amount of pH. Um, what are their water requirements? You know, do they match your site? Are you going to have to water more? It's something like a vegetable garden, you know, may require more frequent watering. Um, the light range, like I mentioned, the sun or the shade and um, the maintenance needs. So how often are you going to prune it? You know, what pests or disease are you going to have to deal with? Um, and then does it 
produce food or attract pollinators. So again, the human kind of centric ideas here, like what do you want your landscape to do for you? You know, do you want it to make food? In our Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide, we have uh, little notations, whether it's a hummingbird plant, uh, a bird plant, or a butterfly plant. And so you can look that up. Um, so we recommend to choose low maintenance plants. And these are things that survive, you know, after establishment on rainfall alone. We get a lot of rainfall here in Central Florida. It can also be plants that just don't require very much pruning, uh, like the kunti in the top left here. You know, that's just a low growing kind of ground cover, the native kunti cycad. And it doesn't really need any pruning, you know, at all. Like you can leave it go. Um, also the liriope, that's a good one. The moly grass, which is a native clumping grass. It just made this purple display in the fall. Um, the cabbage palms here on the left, these are native palm trees and they do really well, you know, in both wet soils, dry soils, they can take sun, they can take shade. They're just kind of one of those bulletproof um, type of palm trees. And these ones don't get the nutrient deficiencies so like some of the imported ones do because they're native and they're adapted to our soils and our climatic conditions. Um, the Schilling's holly here on the bottom right, this is what we call a native var. So it is a cultivar of a native plant. And they created this little holly shrub. So it's just kind of like a round little meatball shape and it grows very slowly, but it's evergreen. And so it reduces the amount of pruning needed, like a regular shrub, you might need to prune, you know, once a month. This one you can prune maybe twice a year. So that can really save you time. And it, again, it can look beautiful. Um, now you can still plant high maintenance plants, but just understand that you're gonna have to give them a little extra care. For example, roses commonly get a fungal diseases. And so if you're gonna grow roses, maybe be prepared to you know, check for the leaf spots and spray fungicides. Um, lettuce, you know, is a great vegetable crop, but it's just very short lived. So um, perennials are better or longer lived things like kale. I mean, lettuce is still great to grow, but it only lasts for 30 days and then you harvest it and then you can replant. Um, this date palm on the bottom left hand side, um, if you look around, you'll see that all over Central Florida. And these date palms have a special requirement for additional like potassium and magnesium that isn't just kind of naturally found in most of our soils. So in that case, you need to put this palm on a palm fertilizer program and make sure it gets those micronutrients, you know, at least twice a year so that it can have nice green growth and, um, you know, not have plant problems. Now, the podocarpus on the right, that's this little trim shrub here. So uh, podocarpus is very easy to grow, very minimal disease problems, you know, it's drought resistant, but this can naturally become a tree almost that gets, you know, 10 to 20 feet tall. So if you're going to try to keep it, you know, at a four foot height, that's just going to be high maintenance because of the shape that you're trying to prune it in. Now, turf grass is also Florida friendly. Um, if you think about, you know, concrete, that doesn't have any environmental benefits, but turf grass, actually, it's a living plant. It's a green plant. It's uh, absorbing carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. It helps to collect dust and dirt. It also, the roots have an extensive root system and it filters stormwater runoff. Um, it also facilitates groundwater recharge by slowing that water down and letting it sink down, especially erosion. If we have heavy rainfall, this grass can hold in the soil. So reducing that erosion and wash off. Um, it also reduces glare and noise. So turf grass is Florida friendly as long as it's maintained in uh, an acceptable way. And we'll talk about that. Um, and, you know, when you just look at the scale of what plants are the most, you know, sustainable or friendliest for the earth, you know, bare ground, 
is not that great. Turf grass is better than that. Um, and shrubs and trees ultimately are the best, you know, for our kind of climate zone. They just can live off of rainfall alone after established if you select Florida friendly varieties. And they provide a lot of benefits to the environment. So um, principle number two is to water efficiently. And you can reduce the need to water, first of all, by choosing drought tolerant plants. So it goes back to that right plant, right place. Also this concept of hydro zoning, where you're grouping plants according to their water needs. So all the really thirsty plants, put them in one area. And then, you know, the plants like cactuses and rosemary that don't need as much water, um, you can put them in a separate area and you could put them on separate um, watering zones for different times if you have the automatic sprinkler. Um, as plants get established, they don't need the regular irrigation. So, you know, gradually reduce how much water you apply through irrigation and then water thoroughly. We want about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch. We'll talk about that. Um, so what the goal is with watering thoroughly is that you want to reach the bottom of the root zone, but you don't want too much water to go past the root zone because that's when we can flush out nitrogen and potassium and other nutrients through leaching where we're pushing those nutrients below the root zone where they get lost to the environment. Maybe they contaminate our groundwater. And so um, generally like an inch of water can go about one foot deep. And so when we talk about irrigation, um, we want to apply between one half of an inch and three quarters of an inch um, per irrigation event. And so like if um, you do your calibration test, that's how much you want. If you just water a little bit, it's not gonna be enough water to get to the root zone. And again, if you water too much, you know, it can be flushing some of those nutrients, leaching them into the environment, which is not good. So in the, in the spring, in the summer, you know, every two to three days during active growth, um, in the winter, um, you know, plants go dormant, like Terry th said, and um, you can water them every 10 to 14 days. So we have a slogan, like skip a week in the winter because plants are just not growing that much and they don't need that regular irrigation. So um, another thing is to follow the water restrictions. So we're currently, it's uh, November, we're currently in that one day of watering per week. And then in March, the second Sunday of March, then we bump it back up to two days per week. And that's really the time of critical irrigation. If you're getting some new plants established or if you have some already in the ground, keep an eye on your plants, you know, March, April, May, because those can be our driest months here in Florida. Another thing is that it's best to water in the morning for the health of the plant. Um, there's no watering between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. because that water can be um, lost into the air through evaporation. But it's best to water in the morning for the plant's sake because the plant can absorb the water and then it dries off during the day. It, you can also water in the evening for the evaporation thing. But if you have plants with wet leaves at night, it can increase fungal disease problems. So water in the morning if you can, um, you know, check your plants in the evening. If it really needs water in the evening, then go ahead and water, but otherwise try to keep it in the morning. And so um, these timers, don't just set it and forget it. That's our slogan. So your watering schedule should change several times a year um, at least learn how to turn it from off to run or auto. And then um, you might need to reduce the time as plants become established. You're gonna have to change it from one day a week to two days a week um, when we have that daylight savings change. And when we get those summer rains and we get eight inches of rain a month in the summer, um, that's plenty of water for the plants. Like on average, most plants only require one inch of water per week. And so they're getting uh, 
you know, probably twice as much water as they really need in the summertime. So you might just turn that whole irrigation system off, you know, once the summer rain starts until it starts to dry out in the fall, like October or November. And remember about that winter dormancy. So even though you might be doing once a week in the winter, you might just turn it off for a week. You know, if everything's watered or if we get some rain, um, then you can turn it off. And, um, you know, just a little fact here that these automated irrigation systems, they're kind of wasteful of water um, because people don't pay attention to the timer. You know, there might be breaks or leaks. So they do require maintenance and um, they can use almost 50% water more than like hose and sprinkler or non-automated, you know, types of systems. So um, just pay attention to them. And here's how you can calibrate your sprinkler system to see how much water you're applying in each irrigation event. So remember the number we were aiming for? About one half to three quarters inch of water per irrigation application. So the way you do this is you place some cups or tuna cans, you know, in your irrigation zone and then run the zone, either the standard time or push you know, the manual button for the same time. And then take a little ruler and measure the water collected in all of these, you know, 10 cans or so. And all of them should be, you know, between that range, half an inch to um, three quarters inch. And you just calculate the average amount in inches. And then if you're a little light on the watering, if you're not quite getting to half an inch, then you might need to bump up your time on that zone a little bit. If you're more than one inch of water per zone, per watering time, um, you might need to reduce the time, maybe from 30 minutes to 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, do this little calibration test. It's pretty simple. And then you can tell how much water you're putting out and you can adjust it to the optimal watering, which is the half to three quarters of an inch. Very easy to do. Um, another thing is that the, by law, you must have a rain shutoff device. And so this can be a rain sensor, it can be a soil moisture sensor. And so make sure that um, your rain shutoff device is functioning. Um, so it shouldn't be going off when it rains and um, make sure that it's not blocked to get the water. So here's an example of uh, one of these rain sensors. And when you look at it really close, these little um, quarter looking quirky things, you know, those will expand when wet. So you can see the guy is watering it here to test it out. And then it sends a little electrical signal to the control timer to tell it, hey, we've gotten enough water. So don't turn on the irrigation system. Uh, these little quirky things, they do kind of biodegrade. And so that's why you need to check it once a year to make sure it's working properly. And, um, you know, just make sure this is working because we definitely don't want to be irrigating while it's raining, that's a waste of water. Here's the soil moisture sensor. Some people like these better because they last a little longer. They're not so um, prone to biodegradation. And you can just put it under a little flap of your turf grass and you see the wire goes back to the sensor. So you might want to bury that too. And um, you just want to put it out in a representative, you know, moisture area in your landscape and keep it away, five feet away from your house and stuff. Um, if it's in a turf zone, keep it three feet away from your landscape beds. And again, this will send the signal back to the controller that, hey, you know, the soil is moist enough. We don't need to irrigate right now. Another thing you can do to track your watering is to use a rain gauge. So this is like the cheapest, simplest, you know, device. You can get a, a new one for $4. And what you do is um, you put it out in an unobstructed place in the landscape, you know, maybe up on your deck or out in the yard, in the middle of the yard. And then every time it rains or maybe once a week, remember, we're looking for one inch of water a week and we know we're good then go out and look at it, see how much is in there. You know, if we get a half an inch, three quarters of an inch, one inch, then your plants should be fine. 
if we get a rainfall and it's kind of on the light side, then you just observe your plants and make sure everything's okay and then give them some supplemental irrigation if needed, you know? So if you see that we got one inch of rain, then you can hold off on watering for a couple days to even a week, you know, or two weeks in the winter. So this is just a real easy tool and it's fun for kids and stuff too, to measure the rain. You can keep track of it in a little Excel spreadsheet if, if you really want to dork out on it. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is fertilizing appropriately. And, um, you know, fertilizer can ultimately run off into the water bodies. Nitrogen and phosphorus are, are the two main nutrients that affect water quality. But, you know, we don't want to be wasting any fertilizer, even if it's not, you know, bad for our water. So, um, first of all, you know, we just want to fertilize our plants to maintain health. We don't want to unnecessarily fertilize. Um, you know, and there can be other problems, like if a plant is diseased, you know, just adding more fertilizer may not help with that issue. So if you have any pest or disease problems, you can contact um, our plant clinic or every county has a plant clinic that they can um, answer your questions. You can send us an email with your picture of your pest and disease, and we can help diagnose that. Um, also nutrient deficiencies, you know, we take pictures of that too send it to us. And so um, some of the reasons why we would want to fertilize is to increase the greenness or the shoot or the root growth of the plant, maybe increase the flowering or fruiting, um, the foliage color. So like nitrogen has a direct effect on chlorophyll and greenness. And you know, if you want your plant to look better, a little greener, and also correcting nutrient deficiencies, like these three plants on the right-hand side, you know, they have a nutrient deficiency. It looks like iron in the top one. We talked about the palm with the potassium and the magnesium deficiency, making those leaves, those lower leaves yellow. And the turf grass on the bottom has a little bit of iron chlorosis. So you can see it's a little lighter green. And so a little iron will help green it up. Um, so those are some areas that you would want to apply a specific fertilizer to help correct those nutrient deficiencies. And again, if your plants are looking green and beautiful, you know, maybe you can skip a fertilization. Um, and maybe they don't need fertilizer at all. Like native plants are adapted to Florida. They don't need a whole lot of fertilization. And remember that too much fertilizer can be bad for the plants you know, like too much nitrogen will qu quit a plant from um, flowering or fruiting. You know, it can also make the plant more um, susceptible to insects and diseases. So don't just fertilize, you know, for the fun of it. You know, um, you should know what you're doing out there. You choose the right fertilizer that you need. So another thing is we need to follow the fertilizer ordinance. So we have a blackout period between June 1st and September 30th. And that's when you wanna hold off on all fertilizer, um, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, you can apply potassium, you know, iron micronutrients at that time, but you know, make sure you know what you're doing because some of those micronutrients you know, the plants don't really need them in large amounts. So you don't want to cause a toxicity. So just general, um, you know, don't fertilize if a heavy rain is expected. If we're expecting, you know, four inches or even a one inch of rain, like a hurricane rain or anything, because all that rain can wash those nutrients away. We want the nutrients to stay near the plant by the root zone of the plant. Um, but you do want to water it in with about a quarter inch of water. So just a light sprinkle and that water will help the fertilizer kind of settle down, you know, if you're doing grass, you know, into the soil from the grass or, you know, in between the mulch, it will help it, that little bit of watering. And, you know, timing the fertilizer applications to maximize the plant use. So in the spring, 
uh, like March, April, think like tax time. The plants are growing a lot it's for that spring growth. That's a good time to fertilize. Uh, remember, you want to get it in uh, before June 1st and then kind of take a break for the summer. Um, the fall fertilizer, if your plants are looking good, you know, may not need to apply in the fall because that's when the plants are going dormant too. Um, so, you know, you can look at it and, and determine what your fertilizer needs are. So when you're using and choosing fertilizers, um, you need to choose fertilizers with at least 50% slow release nitrogen. And I think they just um, up to the ordinance to 65% this year, 65% slow release nitrogen. And it will say that hopefully on the bag. Otherwise you have to flip it over and do the math. Um, now phosphorus is very high naturally occurring in our soil. And so part of the ordinance is to use a low or no phosphorus fertilizer unless you have a soil test showing that your soil is deficient in phosphorus. And we don't do that at our office, but you can send it up to our soil lab in Gainesville, Florida. Just Google like UF IFAS soil lab and then send them like about a cup full of your soil in the mail up to their lab. And you can get the results for um, phosphorus, potassium, and the other micro and macronutrients. So another thing is like you want to measure your lawn to make sure you're getting the correct amount of fertilizer. Um, like this bag, for example, says that this covers 11,000 square feet. So you would measure, you know, the length times the width, see how many square foot your lawn is. So you might not need a 50 foot bag if your lawn is half that size. Maybe you could get away with like a, a 30 pound bag. And then we wanna keep this fertilizer off the sidewalks. If you spill it, even on the turf grass or you know, kind of sweep it up the best you can and make sure that absolutely does not go down into the drain. Cause remember the nitrogen and the phosphorus are nutrients that can pollute the water. So moving on now to principle number four, which is mulch. So I love mulch. Like I think it looks beautiful. It's very healthy for the plants. And so here's the Florida friendly way how to do it. So we recommend a two to three inch layer of mulch over your trees, shrubs, and landscape beds. So two to three inches. Now, if you put like a nice layer of two to three inches and then, you know, half a year goes by and it kind of shrinks down to one inch, then the next time just, you know, put another light layer to bump it back up to that two to three inch. And so um, we don't want this mulch to be touching the plant trunk because that can cause, you know, insect and disease issues. So just, you know, pull it gently away from the trunk to expose the trunk flare. Uh, we don't want volcano mulching, which is when all that mulch is pushed up against the tree trunk. And um, mulch just has so many benefits. You know, it improves the soil fertility as the organic matter decomposes. You know, it promotes beneficial microorganisms like the good bacteria and the good fungi that help your plants, you know, it gives them food. Um, it also buffers the soil temperature, keeping it cool. It helps to conserve water in the ground. It also helps to block the weeds. So more mulch equals less weeds. Um, overall, it improves the soil structure, aeration, and drainage. It will even help hold the soil together. Um, and you know, some people think it just looks good. It just looks like the landscape is beautiful and finished. Um, some people create self-mulching areas where, you know, they might have a pine tree and they just rake all the pine needles, you know, into that landscape bed. That's fine. You can do that with oak leaves too. Now, what is not Florida friendly is landscape beds with gravel or rock mulch or also rubber mulch. Um, the rock mulch, they increase the temperature. They stress the plants out. You know, they're not really from Florida, they need to be imported. So Florida Friendly says you can use rocks in a reasonable amount. 
you know, maybe like right up against your house for six to 12 inches or, you know, on a pathway or something, but not like mulching for your landscape beds because they don't help the plants grow. They actually hurt the plants by increasing the soil temperature and stressing the plants out. Now the rubber mulch, you know, that's made from recycled tires or something. And that might have some kind of chemicals that are harmful that can leach out into the earth and hurt your plants. So um, not recommended for Florida friendly. Um, there may be new products coming out, but generally we like the organic mulch and, um, you know, made from wood chips. Um, pine bark is good. Pine straw is good. Um, like the tree trimmer mulch is good. You can go to the website chipdrop.com and you can sign up to get a truckload of free mulch from your local tree trimmer. The only kind that we don't recommend is a cypress tree mulch because cypresses uh, naturally live in swamps or, you know, lake fronts or aquatic environments. And it's not really clear where they're sourcing all this cypress for the cypress mulch. And so Florida Friendly recommends to avoid cypress mulch and go with um, pine or malaleuca or other you know, organic types of mulch and then stay away from these inorganic kind, you know, that increase the soil temperature and don't have any benefits for the plants. So um, the next um, principle is to attract wildlife. And, you know, back in our ancient history, like Florida was all a native forest and there are animals and bees and butterflies and birds. And then over time we've developed it and, you know, especially a county like Orange County, we are largely urban. We've kind of bulldozed a lot of these natural areas and we built our houses and installed our turf grass. So, you know, consider giving back a little bit of something to our wildlife by planting, you know, plants that bear seeds, fruits, nuts, you know, flowers for nectar or larval host plants. And a way to um, help to create a good habitat for wildlife is to increase the vertical layering. So you might have some ground covers, some you know perennial shrubs and trees, and that helps to give different sizes and heights for the wildlife to live in. You know, for their shelter and build their home and nest and hide from the prey. It's also good to include a water source, such like a bird bath or a small pond, you know, because just like us, animals need a little bit of water. You can see that little cardinal bird taking a bath there. And um, so that will just help them out. And then you can put other things like that little mason bee house, you know, with the little bamboo sticks or something, even leaving a little bit of a brush pile or a, a dead tree instead of cutting it all the way down, like leave a little, you know, 10 to 20 foot height on it. So the woodpeckers can live in there and other creatures can burrow into that tree. And then it, you don't have to worry about it falling on anything if you already maybe topped it. You know, that's something you can request your tree trimmers to do. Um, if you're interested in attracting pollinators to your yard, what you want to do is plant a variety of flowering plants and plant like for butterflies, like a combination of nectar plants. So that's where they go and suck the, the sweet juices out of the flowers, you know, like this penta pictured here and also the larval host plant. So milkweed is a larval host plant for the monarch butterfly, the passion vine is a good one. Also cassias for the sulfur butterflies. And then plant these in big groupings because bees and butterflies, you know, when they're flying around and then they see like a lot of color, they know, okay, that's that's the buffet down there. We're going there for the food. Um, include some native plants because there's specific insects and animals that are, you know, co-evolved with the native plants and they provide food for certain pollinators that, you know, something like a non-native penta may not provide. And for the most part, these plants need sun or partial sun. Um, again, provide a water source like the bird bath or a butterfly puddling station. And be really careful with your pesticides. Don't spray pesticides. 
on your pollinator plants. Um, you know, just leave it be. You don't want to kill the caterpillars that turn into butterflies. If there's a little bit of aphids, um, don't worry about that. Usually the ladybugs will come and take care of them because you just don't want to harm any beneficial insects. And if, if you have anything bad, again, take a picture, send it to us and we can help advise on that. So like I mentioned, the different butterflies um, have different larval host plants. And so um, learning these plants and um, we teach a whole butterfly gardening class that goes through that. It's, uh, it's on YouTube too. You can watch the webinar recording. That's the way to attract them to your yard. So uh, on to principle number six is manage pests responsibly. So first you just have to get real and realize that it's unrealistic to have like a perfect yard that has absolutely no insects, diseases, or weeds. Because we, we live in Florida. We have tons of insects and disease and weeds. It's just a part of life. Um, but planting the right plant, you know, in the right place and having a nice cover on your yard that will help to um, deter those. So also know that many insects are beneficial and they actually help to keep the bad pests under control. So uh, ecological type of landscape, you might not even have to spray pesticides because the good bugs are going to be out there preying on the bad bugs, just like this praying mantis here. Another thing is just check your plants regularly, you know, observe them, look for pests, um, see if the pest problems come and go. If you have something that, you know, is persistent and is becoming a problem for you or making the plant look really bad, then maybe you can consider a treatment. You know, but we don't want to uh, do a blanket application where we just spray everything. You want to target only affected areas for a specific pest, and you want to identify that pest. So if you do have a pest, um, we recommend using the least toxic um, remedy first. You know, and some things can be just as simple as moving the plant to more sun, reducing the irrigation, um, letting the beneficial insects um, eat the bad ones. If you want to use a spray, you know, think about natural or organic sprays such as horticultural oil, um, Bacillus thuringiensis Bt. That is a biological. It's from a bacteria. Um, also insecticidal soaps. And so these are uh, effective, safe ways to control the pests. Um, if you do a couple treatments of those and you still have a pest problem, then you can, you know, use something more toxic. But a lot of these pests can be controlled with, you know, very least toxic pesticides or organic or, or natural stuff. Um, there is a whole publication, our EDIS publication. So you can Google, you know, University of Florida EDIS and look for these natural products for managing landscape and garden pests. And this goes through all the different controls and the pests that you might encounter and give some really good advice. It's like a 10 page document. Um, on to the next principle, recycle yard waste. So um, this is another great one, a simple thing that you can do at your home, you know, to reduce your kind of carbon footprint and recycle your yard waste and you know turn it into valuable you know nutrients and organic material to build your soil increase the health of your plants so instead of just you know bagging all your leaves and putting them on the curb for the big truck to haul away to the composting facility at the landfill you know you could stash a couple of these bags you know behind your compost pile compost them um, you could spread them out in your landscape or kind of in the back 40, like around your trees and stuff. Um, you can even use them as mulch, like on uh, vegetable gardens and stuff. So um, saving some of that organic waste and recycling it on your own yard is great. There's also composting um, with your kitchen scraps that you can add to your compost piles. And various municipalities offer free compost bins to help you get 
started. I know City of Orlando does, City of Winter Park does. And so be sure to check out those incentive programs. Um, if you're gonna compost your food waste, um, this center picture here, this is a picture of mine and I actually keep it in the freezer. That way it doesn't stink up the house. And then you can feed it to the worms. Some people do worm composting and have a little bin. This is especially popular if you live in an apartment or a townhouse and don't have you know, a big area you know, for a compost bin like this. This is the kind of that was given out with the, the Greenworks program with the Mayor Dyer Green Initiative in the city of Orlando, this one. So um, if you're gonna compost your food waste, you know, you put that in the pile and then cover it up with a little bit of leaves or browns or something so that it doesn't smell bad. Same thing if you're feeding it to the worms, like dig a little hole, add the compost and then cover it up. Um, so the next principle is to reduce stormwater runoff. And the stormwater runoff, that's all the rainfall, you know, that comes on your roof and your driveway, and it's more than your site can absorb. And so it kind of runs off into ultimately our waterways. And so we want to keep that water on site, preferably, and we want to keep it clean as possible. So one of the ways that we do that is, um, you know, we want to limit the fertilizer or organic material from going down the drain or into our lakes. Um, like this picture on the left with all those grass clippings in the storm drain, that, that is illegal. If you see that, you know, call 311 um, to make a report to Orange County because we don't want that to go down. Landscapers should know this, you know, the residents should know this. You should either um, blow it back into the yard or rake it, sweep it, bag it up, compost it, send it to the um, landfill composting because all that organic matter is going to end up in our lakes. And that's what makes it green. All that nitrogen from that grass is going to feed the algae in the lake. And that's why it makes the green color. And then the algae, you know, there's a, a effect you know on the fish it reduces the oxygen we might have a fish kill you know it makes it look bad the plants might boom and it might clog up the waterways with invasive plants so we want to keep all the organic stuff out of the lakes and keep it clean so also reducing soil erosion you can achieve that by having a nice um, landscape with plants so ground covers um, grasses, turf grass, um, trees, shrubs, you know, just have it all filled up with plants. And that way, none of the soil will slip away when we have heavy rain, because those plant roots are going to hold that soil in place. Um, another thing that you can do is to help the water go into the ground is to increase the amount of permeable surfaces. So that means like rocks, or you can see the alternative driveway in this picture to the right, where when it rains, that water can seep down, even the flagstone pathways, that's better than concrete here. And the water will seep down and recharge our groundwater versus you know running down your driveway into the storm drain and directly into the lakes. Um, so this is how we can recharge our aquifer more. Rain barrels and rain gardens are another strategy to reduce stormwater runoff. So, um, you know, even though the rain barrel only collects maybe 55 gallons of water, that's still a little bit that you can save and then store it and then use it later on a not so rainy day when your plants are thirsty. Um, when you have your drain coming off your house, like your downspout, you know, you can make that go into your landscape bed or into your turf grass or into a pond even to hold some of that water. So here's some examples of rain gardens. So you can create a swale, which is like a low area. So from this house here, um, you can create a little swale that will catch some of that water and then plant water-loving plants in there. Um, here to the right is one under construction 
where their um, rain gutter comes down here and then it lets the water and then they're gonna be planting some plants in here. And then those plants will suck up that water and again, help recharge the groundwater in the aquifer rather than leaving the water quickly off the site and going down the drain to the water bodies. We need more people to adopt practices like this and that will help you know, prevent some of the flooding problems we had in the, in the last two hurricanes. So um, wrapping up here, the ninth Florida friendly principle is to protect the waterfront. And so you want to protect anything around lakes, uh, ponds, even retention ponds, if you're allowed to. And um, you want to maintain these areas with special sensitivity to the environment. So what we want here is we want lots of beneficial plants, you know, to stabilize the shoreline. Um, so some examples here, like this purple pickerel weed in the left-hand photo, uh, this button bush, it's a shrub or small tree in the center photo. That's also a shade tolerant one. Um, giant bulrush or smaller types of rushes. They're almost like grass looking things. And they have the little seed pods at the tip. And so these are great for stabilizing the shoreline and providing um, habitat for wildlife and also reducing the nutrients that are going into the water. They're going to filter the water and help to clean it and absorb these nutrients instead of um, the nutrients being in the water. So some ways that we can help protect the waterfront is if you when you're fertilizing, you know, don't get it into the storm drains, don't get it onto any hard surfaces like your driveways or sidewalks. And that's why they say use this uh, broadcast spreader with a deflector shield. And so that's what this little white thing is here. That way you can just go down the line and it doesn't shoot onto the driveway. Um, if you do get something on the driveway, just sweep or blow it back into the lawn. And um, same thing with the grass clippings in the yard waste. Um, they also want a 15 foot, depending on what county you live in, it might be 25 or 15, 20 feet, where they want a low maintenance zone or a buffer zone, a vegetative buffer zone is the best thing that you can do to help protect the lake or the other water body. This picture right here in the middle, that is showing some native clumping grasses, sand cord grass. And they're planted maybe on three foot centers all along this lakefront. And then they have a little cypress tree in there. And so that is a very low maintenance zone. They might give it a little haircut once a year to make it look good, but um, ultimately they're not gonna irrigate in that area, no fertilizer, um, no pesticides. And so that's what we consider a low maintenance zone. The other one with the colorful um, daylilies and lavender thing on the left, you know, that's still okay. You know, it might be a little higher maintenance than the middle one, or you can just have the, the native vegetation like the pickerel weed pictured on the right. So one more thing is that edible landscaping can also be Florida friendly and just using all these practices, you know, matching the plants to your site conditions, uh, using efficient irrigation and selecting, you know, vegetables and fruits that are well adapted to Florida, you know, maybe specific varieties. And so we have a publication on this too, you can check out. And here are some of our resources. Like I said, you can get all kinds of publications off of our website, the Florida Friendly Landscaping website here. And this is our website for Orange County Extension. Um, this is my Garden Florida Facebook page if you wanna follow us there for your little bite-sized science tidbits. And that um, concludes the webinar. So if you could be so kind as to you know, use your cell phone to scan the QR code, or I can put in the chat box the link to the survey and complete our survey because that's really helpful to us to show that our bosses, you know, that we're doing a good job. And then after that, we can take questions. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to 
unmute and ask your question, or I can look back in the chat to see if anybody asked anything. And thank you for coming. Um, so the question from Jen, do you recommend testing the pH of the soil in different parts of the yard? So um, the short answer would be no. If your yard is kind of like all the same and you can just do one composite sample, which would be one sample, which is like one cup of soil, but you would get it from maybe 12 different locations and mix it all together. Now, if you have some different things going on in your yard, like maybe you have a vegetable garden and that has a specific, you know, need versus your turf grass or your landscape beds, then you might want to sample those separately. And so you might want one for your vegetable garden and one for your turf and landscape area. And then you would do multiple samples and then mix it all into one sample for the vegetable garden. Same thing for the turf grass landscape area, you know, take multiple samples, mix it all together for one. And it is um, $2 per sample at our office. And if you send it up to Gainesville, it's about uh, $10 per sample. So um, Jessica asks if there's any grants or funds for turning your yard Florida friendly. So you need to check out the Flip My Florida Yard TV show. Um, right now they're not taking applications. They're in the filming process now, but you can submit a thing on their website that, you know, why should your yard get flipped to be all Florida friendly? And then they select a couple winners each year around the state. Uh, I think they selected 12 winners and then they will come and um, completely make over your yard for free. And that's uh, the best thing available. Other than that, um, I'm not sure of any grants available. So the next question from Al, um, two questions actually. So I have a separate irrigation meter. I'm pretty sure it's using potable drinking water. Does that still qualify for the irrigation inspection? Um, that might be more of a Terry question. Uh, one, are you on the Orange County Utilities? Because you do have to be one of their customers. And right. oh. go ahead, Terry. Oh, yes. Um, the timer consultation program is, is for our customers that use potable water to irrigate. Yes. And we we look at your timer and then we'll run all your zones to just see if there's any obvious leaks. Okay, very good. And question two from Al, is there any ongoing work with HOAs to update their bylaws? So water hunger grass is removed as a requirement in, um, yes, there is some work about that. We have a whole Florida friendly section. So if you go to your website, I mean the website, or you could email me and I could send you the more specific link, or you can Google like Florida friendly HOAs. And, um, you know, we can't make it as a requirement, but we do make suggestions. We can consult with your HOA and give them some Florida rec recommendations to make it more Florida friendly. So Angela says, what time of the year is best to test the soil pH and it doesn't really matter any time of the year. It doesn't change that quickly. And so any time of the year is good. And then Jessica says, um, Jessica, if you live on the lake and you want to plant more native plants, um, there's no rules regarding how close to the water you can plant. You can even plant in the water. Um, the rules more pain, pertain to if you're going to remove plants or spray something with herbicide, then you might need to get a permit, but it's pretty much free game. You can plant whatever you want on the lake. And a lot of our native plant nurseries, um, like Green Owl Gardens over in Groveland, or you can look at the FANN, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries to find you know, um, native plant nurseries that will carry some of these uh, aquatic native plants. 
All right, so that's that's a good thing. I also have a lakefront landscaping class. That's a webinar recording. You can watch that and a plant list for aquatic plants. So if you want to message me, I can send you those links. So Angela wants to know what are my thoughts about ground cover such as perennial peanut. Well, I think they're great as an alternative lawn or even on the landscape bed. You know, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, but overall, especially perennial peanut, it's a nitrogen fixer, so you don't have to fertilize your lawn so much. It's it's mowable, um, and it's pretty easy to care for. If you do get weeds in it, you know you might have to hand pull them or use some selective herbicides to get the weeds out. But overall, perennial peanut does pretty good here. They're even using it like the Department of Transportation, you know, along some of the highways and stuff. And um, Erive asks, where are we able to see the two books included in the land webinar? So those will be mailed to your house. Um, and if you want to get the digital version online, you can go to the Florida Friendly website. If you don't receive your books by the end of the week, let us know because they should have all been mailed out by today at the latest, depending on when you um, registered. And so we have our mall number one in Clay County, and you are dealing with a weed called sand spurs. So the best way to control that, that's a tough weed um, to deal with. Um, you want to get those burrs out of there. Some people like take a pillowcase and kind of rake the lawn with it, um, hand removal of them. There's also some selective herbicides that you can use and if you Google um, UF IFAS sand spurs, there's a couple pretty thorough articles on controlling that weed. So definitely take a look at those. And um, Minerva asks for the mulch, which is more prone to termites. So that's kind of like a, a myth that termites love mulch. They like more big logs, like dead trees and stuff. Um, so we don't really worry about termites too much. You might not want the mulch like touching your house if you have a wooden house, you know, just because other bugs, but um, I don't know of any specific type prone to termites, probably maybe the larger type, whereas the smaller type they wouldn't be so um, interested in. And um, Jessica, I got your email. Thank you. I will send you an email with that information. And I think that's all the questions we have. So thanks for the positive feedback. Great presentation. And um, please fill out the survey on the QR code or the link in the chat. And if you have any more questions, um, feel free to email me. My email is right here on the last slide. And you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you.